Hello everyone. Um, I'd really like to say it's great to see you, but I can't see you. Um, but I am reassured that you're all there. Um, so a very warm welcome from me. My name is Lynn Barlow and this is our first RTS West of England digital event. But actually I think we've timed it just about right um, because there is indeed some light at the end of this very weird tunnel that we've all been in. High End Drama is back in production and other gen genres are hot on its heels, if not already on the road again. Um, a few protocols for this evening. I'm sure you're all very well versed in this. Please keep your uh, buttons muted, your audio buttons muted. Um, and we will take questions um, in the chat bar, please, um, at the end of our panel presentations. A little bit of RTS housekeeping, if you'll forgive me for a minute. Um, all our events, and that's across the country, RTS events are actually, um, will be digitally delivered until the end of the year. So we won't have any physical events until the new year. Um, and I'm sure what a lot of you would be um, really interested to learn is what we're doing with our awards in the West Country. You know, we had um, our lovely annual awards ceremony ready to rock and roll at the end of March at the Old Vic, and we had to cancel that. But I'm really pleased to tell you that the winners of this year's awards will be announced in the next few weeks. Um, and that's thanks to my really good friends, um, Glenn Rayton and Susie Lambert and committee members who have hatched a fantastic plan um, to make sure that we have something very special to reward our award winners. So do watch this space for that. Um, we have a fantastic panel this evening and I'm really grateful for all of them for giving up their time, especially as it's probably the hottest evening of the year and we can't even have a drink in the bar afterwards um, but just before we come to that I thought it might be useful um, to just consider for a moment some of the figures and some of the data that's been collected around the effect of Covid on our sector and um, you probably some of you probably know this and I'm sure you've all been filling in questionnaires and there is questionnaire fatigue as a resume fatigue but it's really important to collect that data to lobby both our regional government and um, national government for support for our sector. So the Creative Industries Federation, who've been doing some fantastic work, um, they project that in the southwest we might lose 28% of our creative jobs. That's around 43,000. Um, and we might see, and I say this is might, um, about a 1.3 billion drop in the creative industries greater added value. So that's the amount of money that it brings um, to the economy. Some research closer to home and from Bristol City Council, and I know many of you were involved in these surveys and thank you for that. And this was at the end of April when probably the pinch was um, at its tightest really. 75% uh, of loss of income for all cultural and uh, creative organisations and that's individual creatives as well. 68% of the cities and events had been cancelled. And at that point, 56% of planned film and television production had been cancelled too. Um, for the freelancers and micro businesses that are in the audience, 54% um, of freelancers in television and film said that they actually knew how to access support, which is very good news. But 60% of those respondents said that they didn't feel that there was enough support, and that's either industry-led or government-led. Um, and they really didn't think it was um, sufficient if you were self-employed. And I know a lot of you will share that. Overwhelmingly, everybody that's filled in all these questionnaires think that actually the impact of COVID may perpetuate some of the existing challenges around diversity and inclusion. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that later on. OK, so while you're digesting all of that and thinking about your questions, let me introduce our panel and immediately thank them for giving up their evening. Um, we've got till seven o'clock. There should be some sunshine left after that, so we should be able to get outside. Um, we have Grant Mansfield, CEO of Plimsoll Productions. Um, arguably the biggest indie in town and in the region, making domestic and international shows across all genres. We have Wendy Dark. Hello, Wendy, CEO of True to Nature. Uh, she makes great natural history shows um, with some of our best known talent. We've got Mike Jenkins. Hello, Mike, co-founder of Black Wave, our first black owned indie and just starting out in the business. So it'd be really interesting to hear from him. Um, and last but very much, but not least, we have Sasha Mertzoff, who uh, Channel 4 Commissioner and Head of the Broadcasters Bristol Hub. So what we've done is we've asked them all to talk for about five minutes, there and thereabouts, telling us how it's been in the last uh, few weeks and how they kind of see the next six to 12 months. And then we'll take some questions, if that's okay. Um, so Grant, can I kick off with you? 
Uh, sure. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, well, it's been pretty weird, hasn't it? <laughs> is the is the obvious uh, thing to say. Um, you know, um, I, I think ours is an industry that um, really uh, uh, gets its energy from um, collaboration, to be honest. And uh, one of the things that slightly amused me is uh, lots of people who don't work in the media sector saying, um, Oh, do you know there's this fantastic thing called Zoom? Yeah, we did know about that. We've known about that for a long time. We've been using it and it's very useful. But uh, in my view, it's no substitute for uh, creative people getting together and discussing stuff. So um, I don't know whether I'm going to sound like a bit of a dinosaur here, but I'm not one of those people that thinks this is going to change the way that we work forever. I think uh, the sooner um, we're all back in rooms together, sharing ideas uh you know coming up with things together uh the better i mean just in terms of what we did at plimsoll um we've been shut down for just over three months i mean we were um i took the decision to uh close our company about uh, just over a week actually before lockdown was officially announced i mean we um we are the biggest indie outside um uh, London and I actually think that we had not just a responsibility to our staff but frankly a responsibility to the city that we're in to um, to do everything we could mitigate to do to mitigate the effects of coronavirus so we've got a, we've got four offices but our main office in Bristol has about 250 people in it so uh, uh, yeah we shut that down um, uh, just over three months ago um, it's amazing how uh, if you like, unexpected heroes emerge during times like this. And it turns out it's not a TV producer, it's the head of IT, who is suddenly uh, the most important person in the company, who did an absolutely, our guy Rich, did an absolutely brilliant job uh, getting us all ready. And uh, miraculously, um, it's all worked and we haven't had any significant problems since, uh, since we've been out of the office. So uh, that's been fantastic. Um, most of our staff have um, continued working as normal. I mean, one would have to, at some point, maybe we'll talk about what, what constitutes normal these days, but I'd say 90% of our staff have not been furloughed. The staff that we have furloughed, a small minority, uh, we took the decision, I suppose I took the decision that um, we've we've made up their their salaries where appropriate. So nobody working at Plimsoll has, has uh, lost any money. Uh, as a result of this, um, so I think we have, uh, but we have about sort of 40 staff out of a, broadly about 400 people on the payroll who are who, who are furloughed at the moment, um, and I think just uh, looking forward, um, uh, you might have gathered from this, I'm really keen to get us back into the office uh, as quickly as we can. I mean, our, you know, our three principles were pretty simple, really, were protect our staff protect the community, protect the business. And I think that, um, I like to think that, uh, you know, a lot of people have, have, have been focusing really hard on discharging the first two bits. I think the third bit now, which is protecting the business, obviously not at the expense of protecting the community or staff, but I think that's what we need to turn our, our minds to. And, you know, I definitely feel, although everybody in our company has done a really brilliant and rather inventive job. It's not the same as being in the office. So our plan, uh, certainly uh, before the end of July, is to have a significant group of people back in the office. But it will probably won't be everybody. We we will we will carry on. Our office has been set out for sort of two meter distancing. It's got one way systems and more signage than I've seen since the last time I drew down Sunset Boulevard. But there is a there is a there is a system there and I think that what we're going to do is to bring a, a, a number of people back about a hundred which means we'll be able to maintain the social distancing but from my point of view I love zoom I love video conferencing I love this kind of thing but it's no substitute for being in a room with with my co-workers thank you Grant so when do you think you'll be back in the office just quickly uh, it's uh, we got an we've got a we've got to actually have an off-site an outside off-site with senior staff tomorrow we'll, we'll discuss them but, but certainly before the end of July I feel that's really good news um, 
Wendy, uh, how's it been in the world of natural history? Sure, thank you, Lynn, and hello, everybody. Um, and like Grant says, I echo all of that. We're a people uh, community, and and like you said, I can't wait to get back. Well, I am already back a little bit in the office. I'll talk about that. Meeting people, people are our lifeblood, and um, it is a strange environment. Saying that, um, just to sort of reflect on True to Nature's journey from that. Uh, 23rd of March, which really was a, a kind of a pivotal moment where literally everybody up stick that night and by the next morning the entire team, which for us was about 35 people in production, were now working from home, as you said Grant, straight up. Zoom is absolutely the key uh, tool which we've used to communicate. So weekly check-ins with the team, uh, group check-ins, and then a check-in every day with everyone to check everybody knows what they're doing. They're well supported in their, their, their new environment and important sort of checking in on mental health and well-being, sort of recognising that everyone was going on their own kind of personal journey with so much um, uncertainty and concern, let alone getting on with the day job. So that became our reality literally overnight. Um, I had two projects in production at the time. One was filming specially shot here in the UK uh, and uh, the team, uh, and all credit to the team, stepped up to the mark and have continued to film uh, specialist wildlife here in the UK uh, throughout that time. What was really interesting was sort of literally in that moment, you know, so many of our world-class camera people dotted all around the world suddenly were on flights back to the UK and as you may well be aware, a lot of them have amazing kit. And when we talk about our backyard, their backyard for many of them is a field, a paddock with badgers, squirrels, <laughs> you name it. So the nature of this 26 part series we were in production for, especially shot Tales of the Riverbank in effect, meant that we could, um, the silver lining was that we could employ camera people across the UK to capture specially shot wildlife, beautiful blue chip natural history whilst working within those very important COVID guidelines. So we were using government guidelines, PAC guidelines, um, and first option signing off on absolutely everything. And, and of course, from a production point of view, everything we've done is, is supported by insurance, health and safety. Um, so we're, we've been practicing that since the 24th of March and have continued to film successfully and have actually secured another project, which is location-based filming, which is happening right here, right now in the UK. So I think as a production team, I'm very proud of the team. We've kept working, filming here in the UK the last three months. So we've become quite proficient in terms of how to look after the team, work within the COVID guidelines, adapt, be resourceful, and as everyone will do when you move into production, uh, health and safety for every individual is priority. Um, so, so far, so good. Everyone's kept fit and well. Um, the other big production we had, which you might be familiar with, was Expedition with Steve Batchel. Off the success of the first series, we were literally geared up within days of heading out to another remote location. Of course, with foreign overseas travel coming to an absolute standstill and currently still is, uh, that was one of those key productions that uh, within a very short space of time um, has been sort of put into a dormant place but we had just enough time and that's where I kind of always look to the, resourceful of the resourcefulness of the team to uh, win a new, uh, new commission of a four part spin off series for Expedition using the kind of the archive and un the unseen material from the first 10 part series uh, to enable um, a core team to continue working, to keep one eye on being ready and poised to get back into filming expeditions around the world, keep those connections and at the same time be straight into production and, and have a new series coming down the track for TX um, in the autumn to keep that brand sort of active in the eyes of the audience, which is so important when you build brands, uh, both in the UK and internationally. Um, other projects that um, the team, have, there's been a big focus on development because it's something you can do very safely uh, working from home. And um, one of the other positive things to happen from a true to nature perspective during that time was, you might be aware, but Sky Nature was launched um, slightly earlier, but um, given that everybody was out and about connecting to nature <laughs> and the aspiration was to bring nature into the living room, 
launching uh, Sky Nature on the 28th of um, May was very significant and straight off the back of that uh, Tree to Nature secured uh, a new premium natural history uh, sharks with Steve Backshaw both for mainstream and, and for kids. So that enabled again another part of core part of my team to continue seamlessly into production and all being well fingers crossed uh, lockdown starts to ease and that team can get out internationally filming um, from the autumn. And one of the things we're doing, um, having such an international core base of talent, both in terms of directors and, and, and camera people, is looking where possible to work with camera people who live in different parts of the world that we want to film to mitigate minimising travel, carbon footprint and all the other things. So again, being resourceful about finding new and innovative practical ways to work. Um, one other series, again, we got commissioned during that time is using archives. So I gave that's another kind of new business. It doesn't, it's not a substitute for everything, but um, it's certainly something that we're in production now with two series in archive. And I can confidently say that that kind of new business you can do working from home. I mean, I've now, we've got editors working. I've done com records on Zoom final mixes online. <laughs> I've pretty much, well, within the next week or so, road tested the end-to-end -end, um, production capabilities and have, you know, we've, we've won new business, we're delivering new business uh, to the quality and the spec. So it is possible. Um, it doesn't be working together. Um, I've just opened up the office um, last week. So like Grant was saying, you know, hand sanitizers everywhere. Um, you know, everybody who arrives needs an induction. Staircases up one way, staircases come down the other. You go into the toilets, you've got to change it to available or not available. So there's lots of behavioral things we do need to adapt to. But of course, at the heart of everything is people's health, safety and well-being. But the one thing I have stressed, and everyone in my team knows it, whilst we are beginning to open up the office, baby steps, there is absolutely no pressure on anybody to come into work. I mean, the team have been amazing. They've stepped up, they've more than delivered. So they've more than demonstrated. It's not, it doesn't impede work, but nonetheless, what are we 14 weeks into it? The, the, the exhaustion factor of being in digital formats, the, the extra communication you've got to do, uh, and the sort of, you know, for some of the team living in one bed flats, you know, not being able to go out, you just have to be practical, don't you, about how working in this way, it's not as simple and straightforward as being together. So just being very mindful of that. So the last, last thing I'll say, um, Lynn, before you press the buzzer on me, <laughs> I can very happily reflect on the things we've learned and, and, and happy to share those and really super excited to hear from everyone else and what their learnings are, because we can all learn from each other for sure. Um, and we're trialing it, but, but I would say, the one thing in natural history I take inspiration from, some of you might be aware, but the um, origins of survival of the fittest wasn't what Darwin, but somebody who wrote to The Economist. Uh, and it was written in the context of during economical down to economic downturn. It's not the biggest, strongest and the, the, the largest necessarily. It's those that have the ability to flex, adapt and be resourceful, read the environment and then make new um, tracks in that way. And so in the way that then Darwin coined from a, uh, uh, an article in The um, Economist, how nature finds a way when um, its world is turned upside down, I think we at uh, Tree to Nature and probably all of us in the industry, the ones that are surviving and coming out the other side where possible, um, find innovative new resourceful ways to, to find a new way to kind of get back to something that, like we say, we're not talking about the constraints, but we're focused on the creative endeavor, our ambitions, uh, and in our case, connecting people to the natural world, which has been one other upside, seeing so many people in the parks of Bristol uh, and connecting to the natural world. I do feel getting people closer to the natural world from a, um, a broadcast point of view just feels like we're in the right genre at the right time and we're ready and keen to continue to build on what we've achieved to date, but, but keen to kind of build on that. So that's our true to nature up some. Thanks, Lee. Great. Well, thank you, Wendy. And it's actually really, really, really good to hear that you've got new business and you haven't lost business. And I think that's principally probably in all our minds um, going forward. So I know there'll be some questions for you. So Mike, um, small, new, 
I know you've been making uh, waves already uh, on Channel 4, and um, please feel free to tell us about that. But also, you're just at the beginning of your um, company, uh, Black Wave. Um, how's it been? Are you on mute? Yeah, I'm on mute, yeah, sorry. So, um, I mean, like everybody, I was, I was shocked. Everybody was shocked. Everything stopped um, happening. We had a few, we had a commission that we just got, um, which would have been our first one, but that got pulled because it was involved, it, it involved elderly people and um, we would have had to travel to London. So it all got stopped just before the 23rd. And then when the 23rd hit and it was locked down, it was, um, it was surreal. I think it was just surreal. And obviously uh, I started uh, Black Way with Dr. Mina Fombo and we were both just like, Oh wow! So we've just started this 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 brand new company and like really a fresh company with lots of fresh ideas, but it just felt like everything was just yeah closed essentially. Um, that those first few weeks it was um, pretty intense. I mean, before we started um, Black Wave, me, uh, Mina and I are both sort of freelancers and, and we do like you know all sorts of different freelance jobs, um, filming, editing, things like that, directing, producing. Um, but at that point, everything was shut down. So it was kind of like just twiddling our thumbs a little bit. But we, we thought it was, I mean, I don't want to say a blessing in disguise, but it was something where we, we wanted to utilize this time to really come up with ideas and start developing ideas and, and writing and things like that. And me being a filmmaker, I was out when I could film in the lockdown because, you know, to, to get that sort of foot, footage of empty streets um, is is priceless, really. I mean, uh, and and that was something that I would make sure that I did um, as much as I could. Um, obviously, keeping to the um, restrictions and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting time. I think uh, we've during this time, the last three months, we've been developing ideas. But I think in the last in the last sort of month or so, because of uh, what happened in America with George Floyd and the protests that have been happening around that um things have really started to to pick up i mean as far as um i mean obviously what is it's worldwide news what happened in bristol with the falling of a uh, colston statue um i've been following that story for for years and for me it was a uh, quite significant because i knew everything about the story and all the different players involved in it and when the march was announced i was it was it was obvious that i had to go to it um to really capture that story so we went there and uh filmed it and managed to capture something ca capture history um we were just in the right place at the right time and and um i mean that along with all the sort of other footage that i had gathered over the years that's when i just decided to, to to approach you know sasha from channel four and just just to see how we can really tell this story because um there, there's, there's obviously a lot of discussion around you know, diverse voices and, and uh, these, these types of stories. And, and I just felt like it was, it was the right time for this, this, this story to be told. And, and luckily Sasha did. And, and that, was, that was great because, you know, as far as Channel 4 coming to Bristol, you know, we really advocated that because we really loved the sort of message of Channel 4. And, and uh, to, to, to get our first commission with them was, was, was just amazing. Dur during lockdown as well, it was just, uh, it's really amazing. And just provided us a sort of, you know, the energy that we needed to sort of um, just to keep focused on on what we want to do and, and move forward into the future. Um, yeah, and related, related to that as well, um, during the lockdown and everything that's happened, we've actually been planning to, to, to create a, an arts barge, um, a sort of black owned space on in the historic Bristol Harbour. Um, and we decided, decided to just to launch it and see what people thought. And, you know, we, we, we managed to raise, you know, quite a bit of money within a small period of time, which just showed us that, um, you know, keeping on track, keeping focused. I mean, the, the world around us is falling apart. But I think what, what you have to do as individuals is just really try and keep focused on what, what you want to achieve and, and really work for that. And I think that's what, that's what this process, this whole time period has, has, has shown us, you know, about the, the value in, the value in being quiet, the value in being silent and reflecting and really just examining what's around you. I think that was, um, it was good. And, and we're hopeful for the future because as I said, we're a brand new company and we just got so much story to tell and so much energy. It's just, uh, 
we're 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 ready for it to go back to whatever normal that it needs to be. But we're we're ready either way. Well, I, I think that is just so fantastic to hear, and I'm really thrilled that actually you've got some money coming in because I know for a lot of small companies actually cash flow has been really difficult. So it's really good to hear that um, you've got some cash as well, um, Mike. And um, you know, uh, thank you on behalf of Bristol and our community for um, making sure that we're front and centre of that debate on uh, on national broadcaster, which is a nice segue into the man who's at the top left of my screen. Um, Sasha, uh, Commissioner at Channel 4 and Head of Bristol Hub. Um, Sasha, we all know Channel 4 has had its challenges. Uh, the drop in digital advertising is, is not just uh, affecting Channel 4, but obviously all the other commercial channels. So you started with a great flourish, great parties. We were all behind you and then suddenly you were closed down. So um, tell us what it's been like. Yeah, it's been an intense time, undoubtedly. I should mirror a lot of what everyone else has said. Um, having, you know, I, I, I asked a thousand questions before um, taking on this job and obviously couldn't have envisaged anything like this. And so, in some senses, some of the seeds that we've laid down have been hard to realise, and in others, it's, uh, it's very much business as normal, and we're sort of looking at looking at things in, in, in a new light. And I think in relation to this session, I sort of thought about it all being COVID related and that's when we initially thought it, thought it up. But in the last month, I feel that the whole world sort of shifted in such a fast pace and the implications of that sort of go beyond our world in TV, I think, and, and relating to sort of Black Lives Matter and the protests in the US and here and, you know, I'll echo what Mike said, who, who could have thought of, you know, Colston coming down and the impact of some of these things to see the road statues coming down now. If you've read recently, the Lloyds of London and Green King are making reparation payments for representatives of the main communities. And it just feels like it's the start of something quite extraordinary. And so I think the world slightly shifted on its axis and it's very difficult for to know Kind of what's happening i think we're in the tunnel and there may be a light at the end of it but i wouldn't say i could predict either how covid or black lives matter will play out and i had a fascinating analogy recently that, to, that sort of related to our current situation relating to the two world wars and uh, the the analogy is not about comparing the deaths now and then it's more about our reactions to the crisis and within both world wars, there was this sort of idea of we need to do something better, we need to change. And and in the at the end of the First World War, there were the League of Nations, and and then you know, but that didn't work. And we learned up with fascism, and we learned up with the Second World War, and then in the 1940s, in the midst of the war, we had the beverage of pause, and then we had the creation of the United Nations. And we had the inception of our NHS, which did lead to lasting positive change. And so I sort of feel we're slightly, you know, I know this is a, an RTS session about TV, but I do feel in a bigger sense we're sort of at a crossroads and we've got some big decisions to make um, as people, as communities. And I think there's some soul searching to be done about how how we want to be in the future and kind of envisaging what that light is going to be. And, you know, I really respect the way that Grant and Wendy are talking about the fact of, let's get back to work, let's kickstart the economy, give people wages, pay mortgages, um, you know, put food on the table. And, you know, I also think about the way in which we work together and how we can be inclusive and i do think we face multiple challenges and i don't want to sort of sugarcoat that situation and you mentioned the report earlier about freelancers when the and, 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 and i and i slightly feel that you know i've been a freelancer for most of my career and it is I mean, it's tough out there. I mean, it's kind of great. There, there's a really you know once the government furlough scheme stops where people are going to be and there's no easy answer for those and i feel it's really important to say there are some tough times ahead 
and 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 that for us as a broadcaster, there also been some tough times. We, you know, as you alluded to, we lo we we lost 150 million pounds <laughs> overnight in advertising revenue that disappeared, and that threatened our very existence at one point. And so, you know, but we battled through. I think we've done some extraordinarily positive commissioning during COVID. Um, there's been some very fast turnaround shows that I think have been extraordinarily reflecting the nation and also bringing new form to um, to TV and the things that will last long, long beyond there. And we set out, so we've come through, we set out a, um, a clear vision of what we want in the future. We've done a whole range of briefings that hopefully people would have seen and um, if they haven't, that our four producers website now is for all factual has been updated. And so we've got very up to date information in all the different areas, exactly what we're wanting in 21 and 22. And so, yeah, there are challenges, but we've, we've adapted and we, we feel far more fleet of foot. We're going to have to be far more collaborative, far more smarter. Um, and I feel we have got lots to be excited about particularly in the western of wales um, we've got commissions coming in thick and fast from a range of departments some of these are known and public some aren't yet um you know but some we can talk about 20 20 part series coming out of a remote part of north wales so exciting to see a brilliant idea really well really well thought out we've got some heavyweight single feature docs coming out of bristol i personally was massively delighted to, to be able to help commission Mike for, you know, that was the very first thing that I had on screen and I couldn't be more proud to have have that, you know, it be local to have Mike and, uh, you know, and he did such a fantastic job and that's exactly the kind of work which we, we're, we're looking to do. Um, and the whole idea of moving Channel 4 out of London to nations and regions was all about giving a better voice to underrepresented people. And that is both on screen and off screen and getting away from that sort of London centric way of working that the sort of broadcaster has inevitably for decades. And so, you know, our targets are good and exciting. You know, with the Ofcom quota is 35% that's gonna hit um, nations and regions. We wanna make sure it's 50% by 2023. Right now, this year, we've earmarked that 50% of all of our development is going to go to the nation and regions companies. That's really significant. That tells you about our our direction of travel. It, we, we're very serious about this. So when we when we go into you know look at what's being commissioned, it's the first thing we're looking at is the nations and regions good. We're doing our job, and and I I could see on the ground internally the changes that are coming there. I think, you know, I think that, that that sense of hunkering down at this time has been really clear. And I think there's been loads of amazing training schemes that are going on. Then you, your, your one is, 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 is brilliant and really helping entry level people. And, and I've been seeing now that's working superb. We've got, we're involved in a cross part broadcaster, series producer, executive producer level. Uh, scheme in Wales, and that's really trying to bolster that top end um, level in over there to hopefully work on kind of bigger, bigger shows coming out of Wales. I've personally been really impressed with Donna Tabris freelance schemes, I think they've been superb, and, and just like we're saying that Channel 4 are doing a whole month's worth of training just coming up in conjunction with the National Film and Television School. Um, I'm doing one tomorrow morning about pitching to commissioners. It, they're free. Anyone can dive into them. Uh, please do look online for them. So I, I, I feel that we sort of, we, this is a crossroads. We should look about change into the future. And I think that I, what I want to see is sort of change of, of quite normal, normal TV and how we get better representation. And I think we are going to do this together. You know, none of us can do this alone. We can set our quotas and I can give you examples of that. You know, we're, we're, we're aiming to commission six big standalone documentaries out of our department. And we've committed to the majority of those, so four out of those six being made by underrepresented people. 
whether that's female directors, whether that's, you know, from brain backgrounds, whatever it may be. And so that just feels really important. We're not going to, we've got to do this all together. And there are challenges ahead. But I think I would see this, you know, going back to that analogy about the world wars, I just see this as a, as a point of opportunity. And, you know, if I, 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 I'll just end up with a kind of very, very bare and um, simple observations that people are watching TV in greater numbers than they have for years and years and years. I can tell you from speaking internally and with other broadcasters that the, what's on the shelf is pretty bare. You know, in a few months time, there's not going to be a whole load of programs there. So there's a really clear, you know, supply and demand. The broadcasters are going to need programs to be made. And so I would be uh, really advocating for people to just hold on. You know, I know it is tough. I'm speaking to loads of people who are finding it really, really tough. But if we can get to that point where, you know, and it is starting to happen already where we're back into production, I think we could look forward to some very exciting times ahead because we had a flourishing community, we had a flourishing economy before. But I would love to see our ways of working shift slightly in this period of reflection where we get a period we've got we've got choices to make and I think we could make really good ones and that's what I see as the light ahead. Fantastic. Thank you, Sasha. Just one quick um, question. We've got lots of we have lots of questions from the audience, which I'll I'll start running through. Quick question to you. Do you know when your lovely offices will be open again? No, we don't. We know that they're not open until September. So that has been announced. Um, and we're doing it on a sort of I think it's possible that the People in London, some small elements of the London people will go out back first, relating to broadcasts, the really critical ones. We're assessing, there was an internal survey done about what the staff wanted, and it came back as a very clear, at this point, very clear, people weren't, weren't satisfied to go back in. We're not allowed to do external meetings face-to-face -face as yet, and so uh, we, we're working on Zoom like everyone else, and so actually, business goes on completely normally so there's no immediate need we'd love to be the one part i feel that it really is it, it's really hard to do remotely and what we're trying to do and we're, we're starting to do really well is just connecting city people who have no no way of sort of really understanding the mechanics of tv but they're in the middle of an amazing story and they've got great access to some to thing that's going on and link them up with producers and indies. That's really hard to do remotely because we, you do need to, as Grant says, you do need to sit down and be face to face, I think, for those sorts of things. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Don't we all just wish we had chairs in Zoom? Um, <laughs> right, I've got a, a load of questions here. Forgive me, I need to put my glasses on because I need to reach into this very small screen in front of me. Okay, uh, first question from Richard to Grant. Um, he says that he can see Plimpsoll is advertising for roles um, shooting in September um, and he's interested to know what have you put in place for that? How are you being covered from employers liability insurance? We've got a few questions about insurance so it'd be really good to hear Grant um, how you're uh, working through that and also maybe Wendy you could pick up off the back of Grant about insurance because people will are really interested in that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have to say employers' liability insurance would not be my chosen subject on Mastermind. Um, but um, I, I think everybody knows, uh, without being facetious, there is a real issue um, uh, with insurance. And um, uh, the truth is, I think that um, both producers and, uh, and broadcasters are having to make uh, an assessment about risk. I mean, I think there is a big issue to be sorted out with insurance, the immediate reaction of the insurance industry is they weren't going to insure any productions against any kind of coronavirus impact at all. I think that's beginning to change a bit. But in terms of productions that we're getting out um, sooner rather than later, and we're, we're, we're making a big series for Channel 4, as Sasha knows, which we are in production with now. We have staff, some staff in the office will be filming in September. Um, I think there's a mixture of uh, trying to get comfortable with uh, with the insurance side of it, but to be honest, 
that there is the financial risk and obviously that's a significant fact for both channel four as a broadcaster and all independent production companies but i think in terms of priorities um and obviously this is related to, uh, this this is all wrapped up with with cost and budgets the first thing you have to do is to get your um your protocols sorted out and um uh, uh the show that we we're going into production with which channel four um Karen Plum, who's head of factual entertainment at Plimsoll, uh, told me um, slightly wearily, but also slightly proudly, that she'd written, she was on version 31 of, uh, of the protocols, social distancing protocols. And although it's sort of maddening, um, the interesting thing is that the pressure to get the protocols right came as much from Plimsoll as it did from Channel 4. So, you know, I think we... There is a lot of work to be done for everybody who's who's intending to shoot, uh, make productions over the next uh, few months. It's obviously much easier if you're outside than inside. Uh, Wendy can probably speak to this, but you know, certainly the natural history side of things is, I think, relatively straightforward. And I think um, Silverback Productions, obviously run by Alistair Fothergill, are in the rather fortunate position that they're making a big landmark series about the natural history of Great Britain. And my understanding is that what they've been able to do has been largely unaffected. You know, a person uh, in a field uh, or, you know, in a beautiful part of the country filming wildlife is is pretty free to do it as they will, as they want. So, you know, we, we've we got quite a lot of stuff uh, in production in the UK. It's, it's not stuff that involves entering public buildings. It's certainly not stuff that uh, uh, involves entering studios. And I think as far as foreign filming is concerned i mean you know the thing to say about the bristol production community that i'm sure lots of people know is that most of us certainly it's i'm sure it's true of when it's certainly true of our company and most of the companies in bristol that make natural history filming you know most of our work uh, is probably from clients abroad and it's certainly filmed abroad and i think that presents particular challenges and you know what we found we've been able to do is to use we've done quite a lot of remote shooting so um, shoots where we'd normally have a producer on location, we've used a local camera operator. So in the short term, that's the way to navigate your way through that. But uh, I would say the big challenge coming down the track for uh, companies that need to film abroad a lot, and that's certainly true of all natural history film companies, is that you know we need to be able to get on aeroplanes and get into other countries and that's why actually um there's a whole lot of stuff wrapped up in this but actually the the response stroke confidence of our government uh is is pretty significant because um certainly there are certain countries we'd uh we want to go and film at the moment where we've been told quite explicitly certainly by fixers on the ground that um if you form a, a queue of people that they want in the country first after coronavirus, the bricks would be at the back of the queue. So that's something that we're going to have to deal with going forward. Wendy, do you concur with that? Has the insurance been um, tricky for you too? Although, as Grant says, if you're outside, it's um, a lot easier than if you're in a, a small con confined space. For sure. Um, yeah, I totally um, empathise with Karen Plum as well in terms of the the rigor and discipline uh putting together your company policy now for COVID-19 both in terms of like if you want to open up your office you know the protocol the consideration at every level you really have to step through a, a, a day from the second somebody leaves their house really you know it are people you know going on public transport I'm not asking anyone to go on public transport at the moment I'm not asking anyone to leave their house uh, but as and when the time's right and they're comfortable and it feels safe, then you, you are literally mapping kind of their route to work, for want of a better word, because there are implications. They arrive in the office. Can they go in the lift? Do they go in the stairs? So um, we equally have at a true to nature is a, I call it a whopper doc, but it's huge in terms of now a whole new kind of procedures around just functioning in the office. And what does that look like and the implications? That obviously then revolves involves working with lawyers, um, insurers, and then 
you know, as soon as you're now into production with uh, broadcasters, then of course they've got all their own protocol and they're writing it very quickly. I mean, obviously, Sasha, you're aware of that they've been Channel 4, you know, we work with Sky, BBC, UK TV, you know, they've all got, you know, I'm talking to Nat Geo and Discovery, Netflix, all of them. We are now, as part of our discussions with them, a big part of that contractual arrangement is a huge document now around what we call COVID safe, COVID-19. Um, and that, um, I agree with you, Grant, in our industry in particular, to see the 14-day quarantine reduced or, or, or to go away is massive. So all our budgeting is now the kind of COVID-19 with 14-day quarantine and without it. And what it does, the budget is massive. So that's another huge implication. Are we paying for 14 days for people to sit at home or indeed go to a country and sit in, in a kind of, in a, in a single room for 14 days before they even start filming? Well, you know, that does massive things to the budget, but um, we're working through all of that. Uh, and then the level of health and safety, you do have to have, you know, this is where expertise really matters in terms of when we've got, which we have at the moment, I've got multiple crews on location right now filming and almost every day those PRA forms are being updated and refreshed as, you know, from two metres to one metre. What does that mean? We can be from the 4th of July, people can stay overnight. We've had people staying in, um, in their own camper vans uh, in a COVID-19 world. <laughs> so, I mean, there's every different way of doing it, but First and foremost, rigor and discipline around the COVID protocols, both for your own company in and on location, both here and overseas, knowing the overseas policies, then within the broadcasters, what they are comfortable and what they aren't, and then a huge amount of work through lawyers and um, insurers to get to a point where you have mitigated the risk to a level by which you as you know i don't want to be responsible for fatalities or injuries you've got to think about looking any loved ones um uh, in the eye uh, so every step you take as somebody responsible for your team of people if the worst were to happen you have to live with that on your conscience and therefore you have to dig deep to know is there anything you could have done to mitigate against that and when you feel you've reached a stage where you've mitigated against every eventuality, you then have to make an informed decision about whether or not you even want to do that. You know, is it worth it? Uh, and I would say in natural history and particularly doing expeditions, I spend my si time signing off 50 page health and safety PRA forms because I spend my life sending people to countries where you've got Zika virus. So, um, SARS, Ebola, Ross River disease, dengue disease, <laughs> very little good um, hospitalization and sanitation. And so a lot of that rigor and discipline we do with um, Secret Compass and others, sort of military grade, I would say we've adopted military grade approach to making our office in Bristol and what we're doing in the UK, um, mitigating risk and, and doing that probability analysis around are we confident to proceed with that activity and have we put everything in place and it, crucially is everyone who signs up to it we are asking them to sign the form be absolutely crystal clear and constant communication if anyone's got any fears anxieties or worries this isn't the right project and they shouldn't step forward you have to step forward in the knowledge that you have you know what you're doing you're fully supported and you make a conscious decision collectively as a team and be clear about where responsibility lies so it, it's on an on another level but i would say that natural history 30 years training of pra forms um, has probably helped myself and my production team who are very experienced to work through this um, pandemic uh, applying the same level thanks there are so many levels of complexity aren't there um Thank you, Wendy. We have got some uh, questions about um, new talent. We've got a question from Philip um, to all of you. So perhaps, um, Mike, you might be able to, to help with this one. He says, uh, Philip says that he's coaching some uh, new people into the industry and new, uh, new uh, talent. What's the best way for them to pitch their new ideas? How do they get a foothold? Sasha, you can pick up as well after this. But what do you think, Mike, as a, as a new company? Um, what advice could you give to somebody who's got a great idea um, and they don't really know their way around the industry? I mean, I would say probably like watch programs that 
are sort of similar to the type of programs you want to make. So you have an understanding of how things are put together or how things have been put together before. But I mean, I guess really it's all about, um, you know, the, the, the characters, who, who your characters are, what, what the story is, what, what, why do we want to, why does a broadcaster want to, should, should a broadcaster play this now? I think having those questions in your head, but then also trying to be visible and contacting um, other production companies, because if you haven't got a production company, um, that's what you would need in order to, to put ideas in front of commissioners. Um, but I think it's just one of those things. I mean, I'm still learning myself. As I said, I'm quite new to this, so I'm still learning this process myself. But I mean, it's all about, you know, relationships, going for a coffee, which obviously we can't do at the moment. So it's difficult. It's difficult times to really be putting ideas out there. Um, so as far as, I mean, looking to the future, I think it's just making sure that you're in a, in a space where you can be, you can be seen and be heard. Um, yeah, which is obviously getting a lot more difficult. Mm. Sasha, what do you think for, for, for new people? I've also got a question about somebody that's got a, um, uh, a cracking format, which I'm going to ask um, Grant some advice on in a minute. But what about advice to, to those people that are just taking their first steps into the industry? Because they, they're the, the most important people going forward, actually, how we can support and, and ensure that they get the best opportunities. I think that a lot of when, if I think back to when I started out in the, in the industry, I just didn't understand how the mechanics of broadcasting worked. And so, you know, the importance of the timing of an idea, what does the channel want, what slot are you looking for, all of the kind of the, the actual, because, you know, you might have a great idea but actually is it going to work and that whole thing that Mike was talking about why now is always a particularly important question for us. I think the nurturing of new talent is kind of something which we as a group are going for kind of acutely aware of at the moment. I think it's very difficult. I think the people to get straight in from from starting into kind of you know a nine o'clock slot is just a, is, a, is a massive learning curve isn't it and so we're looking actively at kind of like okay where are the nursery slopes where's the point where you know louis through wasn't louis through in his first series and all the to do and all that, and many other kind of great documentary presenters they learn their trade and so it's about where are the points where you can do that um, Mike's a great example of somebody who's gone out and sort of made films and it's just kind of that that doing is so important and to have you know um, have things on camera that really show the skills of the presenter to be and what do they have or what's different about them and I think that to be bold and really clear about their calling card you know to think about who else is out there doing those similar kinds of things what does that presenter have which is different and I think there was a time where it would have been like different was would, would have been seen so like, oh well that's 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 quite hard and challenging but now that could be a real asset I would say and so to be really thinking carefully about well you know I talked a lot about representation in my little speech before and I think that if there's a voices that haven't been heard that's a really strong thing to be using in, in, as, as, in your favour. Thanks. Um, Grant, I wonder if I could um, just pass this on to you as well. So, okay, so I mean, obviously it's, um, it is challenging for new people to get a start in the business and especially if they've got a great idea, they do, they need a production company in, in which to help them make that idea. So we've got a question here from um, CV Mastrantonio. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. Forgive me if it's not. Um, they're saying, what advice would you give to someone who's got a fantastic format um, that can be developed in lockdown or just out of post lockdown. Um, are you still open for taking ideas, um, even though you're all dispersed across um, far and wide? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think the great thing, I mean, we talked a lot about technology and Zoom. I mean, frankly, the, the most useful piece of technology, I think, in, in our industry is email. I mean, you know, when I was starting up, if you wanted to get anything on the desk of anybody, you had to write them a letter. I mean, um, I, I'm not... I, if if people want to contact me, they just need to send me an email. Um, and uh, I, this isn't an invitation for thousands of ideas to have on my desk, because I, 
I will, um, you know, I, I won't be able to cope with them all. But, you know, I, I think the, 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 the word of encouragement I'd have is that we're all hungry for good ideas and actually just take the trouble to find out who is the relevant person in the company to pitch an idea to. And, and in the case of my company, it's probably not me. It's a big company. But there is a head of development. They're all on the website. There are producers. Send somebody an idea on an email. That would be my first tip. I mean, really simple. The second one is, sorry to prick everyone, most ideas are crap. And I can say that with absolute honesty because, you know, most of our ideas do not get commissioned. I mean, here's the dirty little secret about TV. I mean, everybody around this table knows this, that even if you are a so-called successful company, your failure rate is alarmingly high. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, we have 10 full-time people working in development. We have execs coming out of our ears. And I would say that our strike rate is probably in a good year, 5%. Maybe it's 3%. So the thing that follows from that is just be a little bit too pra bit pragmatic. Don't get too precious about your brilliant idea. Uh, if you've got one brilliant idea and nobody accepts it's brilliant, accept <laughs> it's a subjective judgment, come up with another brilliant idea. I mean, I this may not sound, maybe this doesn't sound very creative, but uh, for what it's worth, I think that TV in the end is... Uh, in terms of getting ideas away is a bit of a numbers game. Of course, you've got to be committed and feel passionate about what you're pitching, but don't feel that you can only really feel passionate about one thing because you are really narrowing your options. So I'd say email people, anybody around this table would be very happy to respond to a well set out email. Try not to make it too long. Um, you don't need 25 pages, you know, six or seven paragraphs. Um, and, you know, I, certainly in my experiences, you will get a response. By the way, if you don't get a response from that production company, they're not worth talking to. But, um, I'm, I, I, you know, if people email ideas to Plimsoll, they will get a response. And by the way, if people email an, uh, an idea to our company, you don't get a response, then email me and I will ask questions about why you didn't get a response. That's great. Thank, thank you, Grant. Um, I don't want to be the person monitoring your inbox in the next few days, but there we go. <laughs> okay, no. uh, we've got about five minutes left, and I'm going to start with one question, because um, I'd like to, to finish. There is one question which is to all of you, but this is quite an interesting comment. So um, this is from somebody who is an, oh, anonymous, and oh, has she just withdrawn her question? Oh, no, she hasn't. Okay. She says, as a woman over 30 living in the North, I have found it hard to get a foot in the door for camera assistant work in natural history in Bristol. It seems it's a who you know game in the city. Do you think the use of Zoom will help industry reach more diverse camera operator talent across the UK and not only those, burst, those based in Bristol? Okay, who's going to take that? Actually, does Zoom, does Zoom help us? with inclusivity and equality and diversity or not? What do you think, Mike? I feel, I feel like, definitely, I feel like it does. I feel like it's opened up spaces to, um, that I probably wouldn't have been able to get to simply because of being in Bristol. There's certain events that I've been to, um, certain lect lectures that I've, that I've heard and listened to that has become available because of Zoom, which has just been amazing. I mean, I've listened to some directors give real insights into how they direct and direct and actors and, and shoot in, you know, factual TV. I mean, there's loads, there's so many different things that I've been able to consume. I do feel, I, I feel like it's made it more, it's, it's opened it up for anybody that may, they might not be able to get down to that event to listen to it, or they might not be able to afford to go to that event, but, they can go onto a Zoom and basically get all that information and be part of that discussion, which I feel is really empowering. So that is that. I think that's a really positive. I think that's a positive that's come out of this. As far as um, I think going forward, I think it it would be good if more events are streamed live because it would just make it more inclusive for people that can't can't make it. If they have accessibility issues or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's absolutely right. 
that's great. Okay, so um, here's a question to all of you and probably the one we need to wrap up on because we are out of time. Um, it's from Duncan to you all. So can you just sort of think about a, a 30, 45 second answer to this and think about if you having a magic wand? I know that sounds a cliche, but this is quite a big question. Okay, Black Lives Matters has been a hugely significant and important event during lockdown. And we know that Mike and Sasha have done a great job in making sure that um, Bristol's part in that is front and centre in the national contest through the, ball, through the Channel 4. So that's great. Okay. What does the panel think we as a sector could and should do to address that? Now, there are hundreds of training schemes. There's quite a lot of money going into it. Try and try and not think about those. If you had a magic wand, I'm going to leave you to last, um, Mike, if that's okay. If you had a magic wand, how would we go about addressing um, the appalling lack of inclusivity in our sector. Wendy, I'm going to ask you first. Um, well, you just said you can't say training, but that is, that's to support entry level and that therein lies the challenge is getting that first step in the door in order to get the industry experience, which is where you start to get your um, uh, kind of credits, the traction which is, which is what makes it very difficult in the beginning. So more of that, and we've definitely been looking at building more contacts in order to get that kind of, um, it's not even really grassroots level, but it's definitely entry level. I think, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my team overall. I think I've got a very young team overall. I've got, you do need experience, but I think that's also key in terms of, attitudes, approach, um, just seeing the world differently and just being much more kind of um, proactive as well in terms of uh, being less risk averse to doing new things differently. And I think that is the absolute, often the key to it, where we often don't try new things because we're fearful. And so finding ways to eradicate fear, to be embracive, inclusive, and to realise that actually there you can put a good supporting environment in from which new and exciting things happen and therein lies the creative endeavour. So um, okay. it's a lot I, slightly long worded, but, but yeah. um, that's the spirit of how I hope I, along with everybody else, is doing everything I possibly can to support um, okay. this cultural change to our industry. Sorry to wind you up, Wendy. We, we really just must go quickly as we'll get cut off by the RTS Zoom account. Um, Grant, what do you think about the, um, the BBC's announcement that they're actually uh, putting quite a lot of money into changing the, uh, the dynamics and the commissioning rules um, for programmes going forward? Do you think that's a, that's, a, that's a healthy thing to be doing? What, in the context of the Black Lives Matter conversation? Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I mean, <laughs> it's trying to say there is no magic wand, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to make general. We've all got to do more. And the, 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 you know, the truth is that you know, the media sector has not done enough. I think we're all, you know, we're all liberal, frankly, mainly white people. We're all very good at, uh, at explaining why we're very open minded. And, and of course, we want the, the industry to be more representative. And I think that said with all genuineness. But I think the truth is that you know, actually, you've got to do the hard yards. It's just hard work. You've got to be much more proactive. I think the things are beginning to change. I'll just say very quickly, I, uh, I know, Lynn, you work at the university, but I, I, I'm a governor at one of the local universities, and it's interesting how they really have changed their BAME representation in the university over the last 10 years. It's now, I think, at about 26%. There is no magic wand. It's just a lot of proactive hard work and instead of people talking the talk it's people walking the walk so I think the industry genuinely I think it's changing for the better but we are where we are because lots of people have talked about doing stuff and not enough people have actually done anything and frankly I'd probably include everybody in this room you know it's not enough just to say it's terrible let's do something about it you've got to you know, you've got to do stuff. And as Wendy says, it is about training schemes and all the rest of it. There's a whole bunch of stuff. There's no magic wand. But we, 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 you know, it is, I think it is an apps, you know, it, it is, it, it's, a, it's an embarrassment. It really is. And it's also, it's more than an embarrassment. It's an existential threat to our very existence because we 
you know, the old fashioned word broadcasters, we're trying to appeal to broad audiences. How on earth can we do that if it's all being seen through the prism of, you know, frankly, a bunch of middle class white people? Nothing wrong with middle class white people, in my view, but they should be part of they should be part of the group, not the whole bloody group. Um. <clears throat> Strong words to finish and thank you for that and I'm, I'm really sorry that I'm going to have to wind that up now and not because I don't think this conversation, um, we should be leading this conversation going forward. We are so fortunate in the city to have Channel 4 um, uh, supporting us in this endeavour um, and we will be continuing to have a, a series of conversations around this so if um, anybody's got any ideas please um, let us know at the RTS and we'd be very happy to facilitate those. Um, I have to say, just very quickly running some of these questions we didn't get to. Mike, I really feel that you're going to have an enormous amount of CVs and uh, offers from people. Um, I've got several people asking me for your email, but as I'm not going to do that, they're going to have to find you um, through Black Wave. Uh, and if they've got any um, gumption, they'll be able to do that, really. Um, I've got uh, quite a lot of questions um, about mental health and monitoring of the teams during the pandemic and, uh, you know, uh, a pat on the back to Wendy for ringing everybody every day and saying that that must be an enormous um, toll on your teams, but very important. And lots of questions to you, Sasha, about um, training schemes um, with Channel 4 as well. So I think you can all probably expect quite a lot of CVs and um, and contact in the next few days. So thank you. Um, if, if we've done nothing more this evening than that, that's great from my point of view. Um, this is our first event. We'd like to take some feedback. Watch out for our awards. They will be announced very soon and we've got some spectacular winners. Um, there's still quite a lot of this lovely evening left. Um, I'd like to be able to stand you a drink in the bar, but I can't do that. Um, but we'll be pleased to do that when we can see each other face to face. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Sasha, Mike, Wendy, and Grant. I know you're busy people and it's been um, quite a roller coaster, but I do believe our title of this evening's talk, A Light at the End of the Tunnel, um, is actually quite uh, accurate. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for everybody that's joined us and um, actually, most people stayed with us, so that's a good sign. All right, thanks very much, everybody. See you soon.